Welcome, everybody. <laughs> a few minutes late. Uh, where there's a will, there's a way with technology. So uh, this is the way. If you guys would close it on the way out so we don't bleed our sound into other places' sound as well. Um, as I say, welcome again to Faith Break. It feels like it's been a really long time. I guess it's been, you know, three or four, three, three and a half months or so. And, uh, but it feels good to get back to a somewhat normal schedule if, if such a thing exists. And um, as I said, I started to say, Corinth, uh, Corinthians, the two letters in the New Testament that Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, are, are really some of the most crucial and important letters um, that are in Paul's writings. I, I want to remind us all, because I don't know about you all, but until I, really until I was maybe at least in college and maybe seminary, um, I didn't really think about where did the Bible come from and why do we have Paul's letters and how did they get there in the Bible? Because you just grow up and it's just, it's in the Bible. And well, where'd that come from? It's in the Bible. And you don't really question that or think about that. Um, but the way we ended up with these letters of Paul, there are 13 letters of Paul in the New Testament which means that half of the books in the New Testament are letters of Paul. There's 26 books in the New Testament. 13 of them are letters of Paul. Most of them written to, in, to churches, you know, the church at Rome, the church at Corinth, the church at Galatia, the church at Thessalonica, etc. cetera, um, the people of those churches. There are a couple that are also personal letters, like First and Second Timothy, written not to a church but to an individual, to his young apprentice, uh, surrogate son, son in the faith, Timothy. So there's 13 letters of Paul that we have. We don't have all the letters of Paul. Paul probably wrote many more than the 13 that we have. Why do we have even those 13? Well, let's talk about like these two letters, the letters, uh, the two letters that we have to the church at Corinth. Um, Paul, as we'll talk about tonight, uh, had been to Corinth, had founded the church in Corinth, Later on, when he is not in Corinth, he gets letters from them with questions, uh, with problems, with updates. And Paul responds to those, to those letters and writes letters to those churches that he had formed, that he had founded, that he planted. The people of Corinth, they get that letter, that singular letter, hand-delivered. This is, um, you know, letters had to be delivered by hand. There's no postal service. Obviously, there's none of the modern technology that we have. So letters are delivered by hand. The people of the church in Corinth get a letter. They read it to the congregation uh, at a, probably on a Sunday morning. Um, they share it with the people of that church. But that letter is so full of wisdom and guidance that people make copies of it. People make handwritten copies of that letter. And some of those handwritten copies then get shared with other churches and then with other churches. So copies are made of that original letter. And, you know, the people in Corinth say, I know I have friends in Ephesus. They would really benefit from reading this letter from Paul. So a copy of that letter is made, or at least sections of that letter are copied and given to people in Ephesus or Galatia or, or some other place. And then they make copies, and it gets distributed that way. When the Bible is actually assembled by the church, it's two to three hundred years later. And, and the church, you know, when they're not running from persecution, when they're finally able to sort of take their breath, they start assembling what we would call the New Testament. And the church has to decide which documents, which letters, which gospels, which, which written materials are reliable, are written by those who had an encounter with Christ, that have firsthand witness information, that are from a reliable source. And they gather those together. And more and more and more copies are made until the church begins to collect those documents. 
Paul's letters, the Gospels of Matthew and Mark and Luke and John, letters of Peter and James, the book of Revelation, which is a whole other thing, but those letters get collected and read in churches. So what we have, you know, when we have our Bible, these letters, we don't have any of the original manuscripts. We don't have any of the actual handwriting of Paul. We have copies. And there's a whole science of, of scholars whose job it is to try to date those copies. How close to the original were they copied? You know, were they copied five or ten years after the original? Were they copied 50 years after the original? Are they a copy of a copy of a copy? <laughs> you know, how, how close to the original manuscript of Paul can we get? And that's the way it is with any book of the Bible. There's a whole field of biblical scholarship. I had to take a class in this. There's a whole field of biblical scholarship that examines texts, that examines manuscripts, that examines copies, that examines scrolls. And their job is to determine where are the most reliable, most ancient, most close to the original versions we can find. So that's a whole science of biblical scholarship. Now, a side note that just to tell you how careful these copies are, the New Testament copies that we have, you know, Paul is, Paul's letters are some of the earliest documents we have. Paul wrote these letters primarily from the late 40s up through the early to mid 60s as in the year 45 A.D. up through maybe the year 62, 63 A.D. That's when Paul wrote these letters. And so some of the copies we have are dated from that first century, very close to the original, some of the copies we have. The Old Testament books, of course, are much, much, much older. And how many of you all have heard of the, the Dead Sea Scrolls? <laughs> you know. How many of you know what they really are? Because <laughs> you may have heard of them, but it's like, well, I've heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls, but I'm not sure I know what they are. Back in the 1940s, there was a, a boy uh, just walking through some of the desert places in, uh, in Israel. And he was just kind of messing around, throwing rocks, throwing sticks. He went into a little cave and he found jars in that cave. And without going through the whole thing, the, the jars in that cave near the Dead Sea contain scrolls of Old Testament books that dated back to the first century AD. So these scrolls that, he, that were found in the 1940s were scrolls that were over 1,900 years old. And those scrolls became the oldest manuscripts of some of the Old Testament books that we have. Up until that point, most of the Old Testament books, that were, which were, again were copies of copies of copies of copies, most of, before that point, the oldest ones were usually from the 3rd or 4th century A.D. So these, the Dead Sea Scrolls were older than any existing Old Testament copies. So, of course, they compared the Dead Sea Scrolls with the ones that we had had, well, you know, for centuries. The ones that were used to translate the King James Bible in the early 1600s. They found almost zero differences. Almost zero differences. Maybe a the or an of or an at, you know, here and there. Maybe a couple of, um, you know, a couple of words, you know, but that did not change the meaning of anything. The, that, the, the copies that they found in the Dead Sea Scrolls were incredibly close to the copies that they had used to translate modern Bibles that were several hundred years uh, past that, from the 3rd and 4th century A.D. 
it shows how careful they were making copies. And it shows just the great care that was used in when somebody was making a copy of a, of a holy book, how careful they were. That same care, we think, has, was used when it came to Paul's letters. Um, occasionally, we think there's a gap or maybe something that's a, a piece of the letter that might be out of order. You know, because sometimes all you have is a fragment <laughs> because papyrus and the things these were written on, ancient paper is extremely fragile. And you would have little pieces of scrolls. The only reason the Dead Sea Scrolls were able to survive 1900 years is because of the incredibly dry, arid atmosphere that those jars were in those caves. Now, there's a museum now in, in Israel that houses the Dead Sea Scrolls. When uh, the two times that, that Jeanine and I have been to, to Israel, um, we've gone to that museum where you can see the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, and of course, even though I took Hebrew in, in seminary, I can't begin to, <laughs> to read them um, because the script is very different from modern Hebrew script. But anyway, all that to say, when you think about the books of the Bible, you realize um, that these were copies of copies of copies that we have. We don't have any of the original manuscripts. So what we are looking at is a is copy of a copy of a copy of Paul's letter to Corinth that then got copied a billion, uh, not a billion, copied thousands of times and distributed out. So having said that, let's think about Corinth because we're going to look at First and Second Corinthians. Let's look at at the city of Corinth. If you I know we got a brand new, neato whiteboard here. I don't know if y'all notice this is this is a brand new deal here. <laughs> and um, I have some skills in some areas, but art is not one of them. <laughs> but if you think about the Mediterranean and you think about Greece, okay, and this is terrible, but. <laughs> And then, you know, okay, let's see. Uh, okay, think about Greece and the ancient world, okay? Here's Athens, okay? You know, and here's, you know, some of these other places. Here's the Aegean Sea, okay? All down here is the Mediterranean, okay? Here's Italy over here, the boot, okay? All right, this is Greece. Corinth is there. So as you go online, if you can't see, and I'm sorry, but Corinth is on an isthmus, okay, an isthmus. It's like this little narrow patch of land that, collect, that connected the, this part of Greece with this part of Greece, okay? Corinth is on this little isthmus and that impacts Corinth because it's on an isthmus it's only four miles across here okay it's only four miles across the, the width of the isthmus so trade routes okay trade routes when people are trading from north to south if you're trading if you're bringing goods and services from anywhere here to anywhere here and vice versa, you got to go through Corinth. You have to go through Corinth. What about a ship on the Mediterranean? Here's the ship on the Mediterranean. You could do that and go all the way around the bottom here. That's over 200 miles to do that, to go all the way around here. Or they would take ships, put them on rollers, and literally roll them across the four miles of the isthmus to the other side. Or they would dock a ship here, unload the cargo, and put it on another ship over here. All of that to say, if you're talking about trade routes, north to south, east to west, you're going to go through Corinth. Corinth is a huge commercial center. 
It, it is, it is, you're forced to go through Corinth in this whole region if you're bringing goods and services. So that made Corinth a wealthy place. But it also made it a lot of other things. It was called the Bridge of Greece. It was called the Lounge of Greece. There were games held in Corinth. There were the biggest games held in the ancient world were the Olympics. The second largest games held in the ancient world were the Isthmian Games, which were held in Corinth. So the, the second largest games were held in Corinth. Now, they were a place that is a commercial center. Um, all kinds of people from just about every walk of life are in Corinth. Um, Corinth, I've said this before in sermons and lessons, if you tried to think of a modern American city that would be somewhat analogous to Corinth, the analogy would be Las Vegas, as in Sin City. Corinth was a city where you could find any vice you could imagine. And one of the main reasons for that was the, the center of town was the Temple of Aphrodite. The Temple of Aphrodite. If you remember your Greek mythology, Aphrodite is the goddess of what? Love. That's right. Aphrodite is the goddess of love. Her, her Greek name is Aphrodite. Her Roman name is Venus. She is the goddess of love. And therefore, how do you worship Aphrodite? With sex. The temple of Aphrodite employed a thousand prostitutes. A thousand sacred prostitutes worked at the temple of Aphrodite. So this was how you worshipped the goddess Aphrodite, was to sleep with one of the sacred prostitutes. So this added a lot of um, people made journeys to Corinth. Um, there were several jokes and sayings about that. Um, one of the sayings of the ancient Greece was, not every man can afford a trip to Corinth. Um, there was a verb in Greek to Corinthianize. It meant to live a life of debauchery, to live a life of indulgence and sin. In Greek plays and in Greek dramas, you know, and of course in Greece, plays and dramas are a big thing. Um, when a character would come on stage and they would say, where, you, where are you from? Or you know, what's your hometown? And the character would say, Corinth. The audience would laugh because they knew the character was going to be a drunk. So that is the reputation of Corinth. Corinth is Sin City. Corinth is also the trade center, the crossroads of Greece. Um, and, and it had a very mixed population. Um, there were retired Roman soldiers who lived there. Uh, there were sailors who lived there. There were tradespeople who lived there. There were people from many different countries who lived there. There was a large Jewish population in Corinth. So there's lots of different types of people, a very you know, mixed bag of folks living in Corinth. Now, with that in mind, understanding that what Corinth is... Um, you know, I, so if you're my age or older, you remember an old, really old commercial about fine Corinthian leather. <laughs> I think it was Ricardo Montalban doing that commercial. Uh, if you think of architecture, you talk about Corinthian columns, you know. Um, but before we actually read the first chapter of First Corinthians, let's read about Paul's time in Corinth, okay? Because Paul starts a church founds a church in Corinth. And that'll help us to understand his letter. So go back to the book of Acts. Um, the book of Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18. And, oops. 
I gotta get there myself. Skipped right over. Okay, there we go. Acts 18, starting at verse 1. So, in the previous chapter, chapter 17, Paul has been in Athens. Okay. Athens is where Paul is in chapter 17. Um, and I'll talk more about that later. But again, if you, if you try to think of, okay, if, if Corinth is Las Vegas, Athens is an, I don't know, when you think of what city is known for its intellectualism and its um, study and its, you know, universities, I don't know. Boston, maybe? I, I mean, I don't know. Um, if you think about what Athens is like. Okay, so he's come from Athens, a city known for philosophers and intellectuals. He's come from Athens, and he's gotten now to Corinth, a city known for vice, debauchery, and drunkenness, and the temple of Aphrodite. So that's, he leaves, he leaves Athens at the end of chapter 17, and then chapter 18 of Acts. After this, 18.1, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had ordered all of the Jews to leave Rome. Sidelight, yes, historiker, the emperor Claudius expelled all Jews from the city of Rome few years before Paul arrived in Corinth. Scholars debate Claudius's motivation for that. Some think it's because as Christianity began to grow, the conflict between Jews and Christians flared up in um, squabbles and that Claudius hated any kind of dis, you know, dissent or disruption and considered Christians still as a subset of Judaism and just told them all to get out of town. But we're not entirely positive of, of uh, Emperor Claudius's motives there, but he had forced all Jews to leave the city of Rome, so they'd spread out to other places, and these two, Priscilla and Aquila, had come from Rome and were now living in Corinth. Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker, as they were, he stayed and worked with them. We know this about Paul. Paul wasn't just a traveling preacher. <laughs> Paul wasn't just an evangelist uh, or a missionary. He had to feed himself. He had to make a living. And, so, and most rabbis had a, a job. Most rabbis did not make a living from teaching or preaching. or own. Most rabbis had a job. Matter of fact, even today, um, I don't know if the term is used that much anymore, but pastors often who work at small churches, you know, part-time pastors who work at small churches, we often say they have a tent-making ministry because it's referring back here to Paul um, because they don't make a living from being a pastor because they're pastoring some little church in some little town. Um, so Paul made tents, um, and that was, his, that was his trade. And most Jewish men learned to trade from their fathers. Um, you know, Jesus learned to be a carpenter from Joseph. And often a trade was passed down father to son to son to son to son to son. You know, if you were a carpenter, probably your great-great-great-great-grandfather was also a carpenter or a fisherman or in this case, a tent maker. And he probably made other items out of animal skins and things like that. But that was, he, he was called a tent maker. So he's, he meets up with two fellow Jewish Christians named Aquila or Aquila and Priscilla. And because they are already Christians and because Paul is a Christian and they're all Jewish and they're all tent makers, they start working together. And that's how he meets these two people. So he stays with them. He ends up staying with Aquila and Priscilla there in Corinth. It says he stayed and worked with them. Verse 4, every Sabbath he reasoned in the synagogue trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. 
Now, again, I'm not to cover too much things that I've covered in previous times, but Paul's modus operandi was always the same. Well, just almost always the same whenever he went to a new village, a new town, a new city. Remember, Paul is a Jew. He's not just a Jew. He's a Pharisee. At least he's a former Pharisee. He, he studied under Gamaliel, the great rabbi that was, is revered by Jews even today. But he becomes a follower of Jesus. So he is, he is a Jewish Christian. And so what he would do anytime he visited a town, the first thing he would do would be go to the synagogue. And as I even said in my, my sermon Sunday, the synagogues did not have a permanent preacher or a permanent rabbi. Different people took turns, different rabbis and speakers and elders taught or spoke on different Saturdays, different Sabbaths. And often a visiting rabbi would be invited to speak at the synagogue. So Paul arrives, you know, he's a Pharisee, he's trained by Gamaliel, he is invited to come and speak at the synagogue. But of course, when Paul speaks at the synagogue, he speaks about the fact that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus is the one. And this immediately divides the synagogue. You know, there are those who, those Jews who respond to the message, and there are those Jews who have kind of heard about this before and see it as heresy and blasphemy and uh, a threat to Judaism. And so it immediately causes a lot of ruckus. But in addition to the Jews in the synagogue, in almost every town, there are what are called God-fearers. God-fearers. God-fearers are Gentiles who are drawn to Judaism. Gentiles who reject um, the Roman religions of like Aphrodite, for example, uh, who reject the idea of the Roman pantheon of gods and goddesses, you know, of Zeus and Hercules and Athena and Aphrodite and Mercury and Apollo and on and on and on and on. And the worship of these ancient gods in the temples sprinkled all throughout the Roman Empire, including the worship of the emperor himself, who is considered to be a son of the gods. There are those Greeks, those Gentiles, who reject all that and are drawn to Judaism because Judaism teaches there's just one God, that he's just and righteous and um, you know, th that he is a good God because the Greek and Roman gods were often capricious, jealous, you know, punished humans for no reason, <laughs> fought with each other. If you read Greek mythology, you know, the gods were always like getting mad at each other and using humans as little chess pieces and pawns. Um, so there are Gentiles drawn to the Jewish God, the one God, but they are not ready to become Jews. Because for a Gentile to become a Jew, of course, involved changing how you dressed, changing what you ate. And for men, circumcision, which most Greek men were not circumcised. And so for a grown man in the first century to be circumcised was a pretty steep price <laughs> to enter into anything. Um, given the hygiene, given the tools, given all that goes with that. Um, so many of these God-fearers would kind of listen almost literally outside the window of the synagogue. They wouldn't, couldn't go in, but they, would, they were drawn to this Jewish faith, even though they were not Jews. So Paul would go to a synagogue. He'd preach to the Jews in the synagogue. Usually he would have some success, and usually he would have also opposition from the Jew, many of the Jews who thought what he was teaching was, was, blas <laughs> was blasphemy, was heresy. So here, here we go there. Every Sabbath, I already said this, every Sabbath he reasoned in the synagogue to try to persuade the Jews and the Greeks, Greeks being the Gentiles. Greeks just is another word for Gentile at this place. Anybody who lives in the Roman Empire at this point is usually referred to as a Greek because that's the language everybody spoke. Everybody spoke Greek. Greek is the common tongue. When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, if you remember, Paul had gone to Athens by himself. His traveling companions, Silas and Timothy, met up with him later on. This is Paul's second missionary journey. Where his first missionary journey, he traveled with Barnabas and Mark. 
They broke up. The second missionary journey, he's traveling with Silas and Timothy. So Silas and Timothy arrive, join up with Paul in Corinth. It says, when Silas and, Paul and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. Reading between the lines here, apparently when Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, they brought money from those other churches that allowed Paul to not have to make tents, that allowed him to be able to focus exclusively on evangelism. So, I mean, that, it doesn't say that, but it says when they arrived, now he could devote himself exclusively to that. There had to be monetary support had to be a part of that. So that's probably what we understand from that. But when the Jews opposed Paul, verse 6, when the Jews opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, your blood be on your own heads. I'm clear of my responsibility. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. So this is these, these Greek God-fearers. Then Paul left the synagogue and went next door to the house of Titius Justice, a worshiper of God. So he, he literally, there's a, a house next door to the synagogue. Paul, because of all the opposition to the synagogue, starts preaching and teaching next door at this house of this Christian believer. Crispus, verse 8, the synagogue ruler and his entire household believed in the Lord. And many of the Corinthians who heard him believed and were baptized. This is huge. Crispus is the synagogue ruler. That doesn't mean, say, they didn't have a, a senior pastor or a senior rabbi. The synagogue ruler would be analogous in our church to the chairman of the trustees, okay, in some ways. The, the man who was responsible for the upkeep of the synagogue, for um, you know, organizing things, for who's going to be invited to speak. I mean, just he was the guy. He wasn't necessarily the, the teacher or the preacher, but he was sort of in charge of the facility and what happened inside the facility. That's the ruler of the synagogue. The ruler of the synagogue, who obviously is Jewish, becomes a Christian which is a big deal to, for the synagogue ruler to become converted and start following Paul. So, um, and not, not only him, his entire household, and many other there in Corinth believe and are baptized. And that's going to come into play in this letter, 1 Corinthians 1. So they believe and they're baptized. So Paul's in Corinth, verse 9. One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision, Don't be afraid, keep on speaking, don't be silent. I'm with you, no one's going to attack and harm you. I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed on for a year and a half teaching from the word of God. So Paul is in Corinth 18 months. We don't always know that. We don't always know how long Paul stayed in these various towns and cities. But here we know he's there a year and a half. He's there 18 months in Corinth. When Gallio was the proconsul of Acacia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him into court. Okay, this is a Jewish, I mean, this is a Roman official. This would be like the Roman appointed mayor. Okay, mayor slash justice of the peace slash, you know, whatever you want to call it. This is Rome's guy in Corinth, the Roman official in Corinth. The, the Jews who are now upset at Paul as being... One, um, they would say a heretic, a blasphemer, and he's stealing our folks. <laughs> folks are leaving the synagogue and going next door and listening to Paul instead of coming to the synagogue. So they're upset with Paul. And so they bring Paul before the secular Roman magistrate. Okay? They bring Paul before the secular Roman magistrate. This man, they charge, is persuading the people to worship God in ways that are contrary to the law. Of course, the key is whose law? <laughs> Which law? Not Roman law, Jewish law. They're saying Paul's teachings are false. Paul's teachings are not in accordance to the laws of Moses. Uh, he's, he's, he's preaching strange and weird and 
disturbing doctrines. As they, they bring Paul before the Roman official. And <laughs> just as Paul was about to speak to defend himself, which Paul is used to doing, Paul has to defend himself multiple places, multiple times. Just as Paul's about to speak, Gallio, who is this Roman official, said to the Jews, if you Jews were making him complain about some misdemeanor or serious crime, it'd be reasonable for me to listen to you. But since it involves questions about words and names and your own law, settle the matter yourselves. I won't be a judge of such things. So, again, you know, you know this would be the same in an American court. If someone says, you know, you know, that preacher's teaching about baptism in a different way. He says, you know, you can be sprinkled, but I say you have to be immersed. I'm going to sue him in court for that. <laughs> if you brought that case before an American judge, I'm suing him because he's teaching the wrong things about baptism. The judge would probably fine you for bringing a frivolous lawsuit to the court. You know, he would say, that has nothing to do with American law. That has nothing to, you know, get out. And that's what this Roman official does. He says, if, you, if the Paul fellow was guilty of some sort of actual crime, I would hear the case. But this is about your, your Jewish stuff. <laughs> I don't care about that. <laughs> I'm not Jewish. Get out of here. So he ejects them. Verse 16, he had them ejected from the court. Then they, and then this, this is the, kind of the tricky part. <laughs> exactly what are we... Then they all turned on Sosthenes, the synagogue ruler, and beat him in front of the court. But Gallio showed no concern whatsoever. The question there is, who's beaten who and why? Really late manuscripts that uh, have, say, the Greeks turned on him. But that was added centuries later. We know that manuscript is not authentic. So that's why most modern Bibles don't have the word Greek there. It just says they. They turned on Sosthenes. Sosthenes is the new synagogue ruler because remember the previous synagogue ruler has now become a Christian. So apparently they've got a new synagogue ruler. Um, and it, in context, at least it appears, at least especially in the Greek, the way it's worded, it's the other Jews who beat him. <laughs> like, well, why are they beating the synagogue ruler? Well, the first letter to Corinthians may answer that question, actually. Um, but did they beat him because why did you make us look foolish in front of this judge? Or why didn't you come up with a better case? <laughs> or I think we're going to see maybe Sosthenes himself has now been influenced by Paul. And maybe he's going to follow the previous guy and he too may be following Paul and leaving as the synagogue ruler. And there's a clue to that that we're going to read here when 1 Corinthians 1. So, Paul stayed in Corinth, verse 18. Paul stayed on in Corinth for some time, and he left the brothers and sailed for Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. And that's the end of the book of Acts telling us about Paul's time in Corinth. Okay? So, that, keeping that in mind, now we can read his letters to Corinth. Um, but I think it's important to realize he, when he's writing this, he's not just writing to just any old person. He's writing to a church that he founded. He's writing to a church that he started. People that he, and he knew he stayed there for a year and a half. So he knew these people pretty well. It wasn't like he just stayed there for a few weeks, planted a church, and then kept going. He was there a year and a half. So this is a church he knows well. He knows the people there. He knows, he knows the town. He knows this place. So now, let's turn to 1 Corinthians, first letter to Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 1. Um, we know this letter, we can date this letter approximately 55 A.D. That's when Paul wrote this letter. We know he wrote the letter when he was in Ephesus. So Paul is in Ephesus writing a letter to the people of Corinth. And it is obvious that he is responding to problems in the church. One of the issues with Paul's letters that we always have to deal with is reading one of Paul's letters is like hearing one side of a phone conversation. Because Paul is answering questions 
but you know, he's answering a letter. He's answering a letter that he's received going, what do we do about this? And this guy says this. And what do we believe about this? And we have this problem. And he's answering their problems and he's answering their questions. But we don't have the letter that he's answering. So we have to assume <laughs> and figure out what his, you know, what his letter, what problems and what questions he's responding to. The only letter that is not like that is Romans. Because when Paul wrote the letter to Romans, he had never been to Rome. He talks about, I'd like to get to Rome, but when he, and he, of course, he eventually does in chains. But, um, but when he wrote the book, when he wrote the letter to Rome, the, the book we call Romans, he had never been to Rome. So it's not a response to questions as much as it is sort of a general letter of, let me tell you about Christianity. <laughs> That's why often Romans is the most important book of Paul's letters, is because instead of being on one side of a conversation, it's a more like he's going to write a paper on Christianity. <laughs> and, and we have... And the first half of Romans is more theological, and the second half of Romans is more practical. And therefore, Romans is often lifted as there's a reason, you know, it's the first book, the first of Paul's letters. One, it's the longest, but two, it's also, in many ways, the one that is, that is kind of the, encapsulates Paul's thinking maybe most completely. But I, I think first and second Corinthians are, just as important and even more interesting because he is responding to a specific church and specific issues in that church. So he writes the letter about 55 AD. He's in Ephesus, and he starts the way he almost starts all of his letters, by identifying himself. We put our name at the end of a letter. In the ancient world, you put your name at the beginning of the letter. Paul, verse 1-1, 1, 1. 1 Corinthians 1-1, 1, 1. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes. Where did we just hear that name? He just the one who's, he's the guy who just got beat up. <laughs> now, is it possible it was a different Sosthenes? Yeah, I mean, do we know it's the same Sosthenes? We don't know for sure it's the same Sosthenes. Um, but it seems odd that... Uh, you know, there's somebody that's mentioned as being there in Corinth who apparently gets in trouble with the synagogue that now apparently is with Paul in Ephesus. So, you know, again, scholars would say there's a good chance it's the same Sosthenes, but we don't know for absolute sure it's the same Sosthenes because there's, you know, a lot of people have the same name, especially women. <laughs> I think, as I said, every, every, half of all the women were named Mary feels like. I mean, doesn't this feel like it? That's true. Half the women, half the Jewish women in the first century were named Mary based on tombs and things like that. Half the women in, in Israel in the first century were named Mary. That's why there's so many of them in the New Testament because it was such a, so I'm not sure how popular Sosthenes was as a name, but anyway, um, Paul is writing and he's saying, I, I'm here and I'm with my brother Sosthenes, our brother Sosthenes. To, so it's from Paul, to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be holy, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is just beginning with a greeting, basically. But, uh, you know, one of the things he says there at the very beginning is he talks about them being sanctified, um, which not every translation uses the word sanctified. Does anyone have a different word in verse 2 than sanctified? I think that's the most common translation. But it, it just, you know, we, we use these long theological words, um, and, and the, you know, we, we use two words primarily when we talk about our faith in Christ. We talk about being justified and being sanctified, you know, and Th those two words have to both have to do with what it, you know, the Christian life. Justified, justification, means made right with God. You know, how are we made right? We're made right not by what we've done, but by what Jesus has done. We are justified by 
Jesus' death and resurrection. We're made right with God by that. But sanctification, sanctus, is, is a Latin word, uh, but it comes also from a Greek word. Sanctus, uh, well, what do we call the room where we worship? The sanctuary, same root word, sanctuary, S-A-N-C. The sanctuary is the holy place. The holy place. The sanctuary is the holy place. So sanctified or sanctification means to be made holy. So, you know, some of you, who's been on the walk to Emmaus? A couple of three of y'all. Um, the walk to Emmaus is a weekend retreat, Christian retreat, that really focuses on grace, but they talk about justifying grace and sanctifying grace. You know, we're justified. Justification is our entrance into the Christian life. But sanctification is the process of living the Christian life where you become more and more holy. Hopefully, the longer you walk with Jesus, the holier you become. And, and it, even the word holy, of course, doesn't mean what people think it means. <laughs> people hear the word holy and they think it means perfect or, you know, I don't know, somebody who has a halo on their head or something. The word holy literally means set apart. To be holy is to be set apart. Um, to be, you know, God is, God is a holy God because he is set apart from humanity. He is different in every way from us, and yet we're made in his image. He is, he is, he is, he is set apart. He is holy. This book is the holy book. The Bible just means book. It's the holy book. It's the book that is set aside. It's different from every other book. To, to be holy is to be set aside for a special purpose. Um, and I often use, you know, to be a silly analogy, anything that's set aside for a special purpose is, you could technically call it holy. If you have guest towels at your house, and they're only to be put out when you have guests, those are holy. <laughs> Okay? Because they're set aside for a special purpose. So they're only to be used when guests are coming, those towels. They're, so they're, they're holy. You know? But then you'd say, what about the towel you use to dry the dog when he's wet? Well, in a way, if you always only use that towel to dry the dog, <laughs> it's also set apart for a special purpose. You know? It would also be holy. So holy is set apart for a special purpose. So he says, you are sanctified. You are, you are a holy people. And of course, he uses the word saint to talk about all believers. You know, sometimes he'll say, to the saints in Corinth, to the saints in Galatia, to the saints in Ephesus, to the saints in Rome. Again, saint doesn't mean a perfect person, Mother Teresa. It just means somebody who is a part of God's family, somebody who has been, been brought to Christ. You know, that we, so the saints is... All of God's people. So when the saints go marching in, it's not just, you know, the ones the Catholic Church has declared to be a saint or the football team in New Orleans. I mean, it's, it's all of God's people are the saints. Um, anyway, so he says this to the people of Corinth. I always thank God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way, in all your speaking and in all your knowledge, because our testimony about Christ was confirmed in you. I'm talking about his, his time there, his preaching there. Therefore, you don't lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus to be revealed. This is, remember, in Paul's early parts of Paul's ministry, he and many, many, many other Christians thought Jesus' second coming was imminent. They really thought they would live in their lifetime to see Jesus return. And in Paul's early letters, you can see he thought that was... In his early letters, he says, basically, it's better not to get married because the time is so short. In his later letters, he says, yeah, you better go ahead and get married. Because <laughs> he says, it's better to marry than to burn, as in burn with lust. Um, so, but here he's still thinking, we're waiting for... Jesus' return, and we've been waiting for 2,000 years. And everybody who says they figured out when that day is going to be has been wrong for 2,000 years. 
Um, he will keep you strong to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, when we are brought into the presence of Christ, we are declared holy and righteous, not because of what we've done, but because of what Jesus has done. We, we are clothed in his righteousness, to use another Pauline phrase. You know, we are covered with the blood of Christ. We are, therefore, we are declared blameless, innocent, righteous. Again, not because of what we've done or who we are, but because of who Jesus is and what he's done. God, who has called you into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, is faithful. So the first three verses are basically, it's from Paul, it's to the Corinthians. Verses four through nine are what we would just call the greeting. You know, he's saying, you know, I thank God for you. You've got the gifts. We're all waiting for Jesus' return. God's going to keep you strong. It's kind of like he's beginning with words of affirmation, reminding them that they are a chosen people, a holy people. You know, he, he starts with his greeting before he gets down to business <laughs> and starts dealing with the problems. Because starting in verse 10, he's going to deal with the problems of Corinth. <laughs> So like first nine verses, there's all kind of nice and fluffy. <laughs> and then we get to verse 10 and he starts dealing with what's wrong. I appeal to you, brothers, verse 10. I appeal to you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another so there may be no divisions among you and that you may be perfectly united in mind and thought. My brothers, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this, one of you says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas. And still another, I follow Christ. So the church in Corinth has factions, <laughs> has, has subgroups that uh, he identifies as four different groups in the church. Um, he says, there are some who say, I follow Paul, some I follow Apollos, some I follow Cephas, some I follow Christ. Well, what is, what is he talking about there? Um, Paul, we know who Paul is, of course. He's the one writing the letter. There is a group there that, that says, well, we, we really believe that Paul's theology and preaching is the one that is the most accurate and the most faithful and the one we need to be following. Another group says, well, we think Apollos is better. Well, who's Apollos? Well, go back to Acts for a minute. Acts 18. Who's Apollos? Acts 18.24. Acts 18.24. Acts 18, 24. Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. This is when Paul is in Ephesus. This is after his time in Corinth. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. He'd been instructed in the way of the Lord. He spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. When Apollos wanted to go to Acacia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote, on, wrote to the disciples there to welcome him. On arriving, he was a great help to those who, by grace, had believed, for he vigorously refuted the Jews in public debate, proving from the scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah. So Apollos is another traveling preacher. He is from Alexandria. We'll come back to that. He said, some follow Cephas. Cephas is the Aramaic word for the rock. In other words, Cephas is Peter. Um, Cephas is just another word for Peter. And then Christ. Again, scholars who kind of try to read between the lines and say, well, what, what are the real differences between these four, you know, these four, quote, factions? Well, 
Paul, remember, the, the church at Corinth, remember, is made up of both Jewish converts to Christianity and Gentile converts to Christianity. There, there is, there's a mingling of Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians in the church at Corinth. And that's probably where a lot of the friction comes from. The ones who say, we follow Paul, are probably the Gentiles. <laughs> because remember, Paul strenuously said, Gentiles do not need to follow the Jewish laws. There were some Jewish Christians that said, that, Jewish, that Gentile Christians did need to follow Jewish laws. If you remember, um, if you were part of one of my classes in the past about the book of Acts, in the book of Acts, in chapter 15, there's this big conference that the church has. It's, it's the first really big Christian council. And what's on the table in, in that council is, do Gentile Christians have to follow Jewish laws? Do Gentile Christians, do they have to follow the Jewish food laws? Do they have to dress like Jews? Do they have to observe the Jewish holidays? And specifically for the men, do the men have to be circumcised? Which I say is the biggest thing that was the biggest hurdle for a Gentile man to, to becoming Jewish. There are some who are some who some Jewish Christians who said yes. They have to follow all the laws of Moses, including the food laws, circumcision, all of it. And Paul strenuously says, no, no, no. We're not saved by reading the food. We're not saved by circ circumcision. We're not saved by any of those things. We're only saved by grace. We're only saved by the grace of God. It's not grace plus circumcision. It's not grace plus the food laws. It's only grace. It's salvation by grace as the only thing that saves us. And, and they have this council, and James, Jesus' brother, if you remember, James, Jesus' brother, didn't even become a, a believer until after the resurrection. So this is not James as the brother of John, the fisherman. This is James, Jesus' brother, the author of the book of James. James has become now one of the leaders of the Jerusalem church, and he says, well, we're not going to make the Gentiles do any of that stuff. We're just going to say, don't eat, uh, don't drink blood, <laughs> um, because that's just so abhorrent to Jews to, to drink blood. And, um, you know, stay away from fornication and food that has been used as a sacrifice to idols. And otherwise, you don't have to obey any of the Jewish laws. And Paul doesn't even agree with that. <laughs> Paul says, you can eat the food that was sacrificed to idols. Well, that's going to be part of his conversation here too. But basically the, the ruling is, no, Gentiles do not have to become Jews first in order to be Christians. So this, this Corinthian church, there's probably an element of Jewish Christians in the Corinthian church that still want them to follow Jewish laws. You know, still want them to not eat pork, uh, to not, you know, et cetera, et cetera, not, not, not break the Jewish laws. So those are uh, ones who probably are opposed to all. Those are probably the party of Cephas, the party of Peter, are probably the Jewish Christians. The Gentile Christians are probably saying, we follow Paul. The Jewish Christians are probably saying, we follow Peter. Apollos, he is from Alexandria. And Alexandria, and, and everything we know about Apollos, Alexandria was famous for oration, producing great orators. And everything we know about Apollos, from the few mentions we have of Apollos in the Bible, Apollos was a great speaker. He was a great orator. He was a trained speaker. And so when he preached, he preached with beautiful eloquence and beautiful you know, poetic language. And some people apparently thought, well, that's our guy. <laughs> look how educated he is. Look how, look how, what a brilliant speaker he is. Look what a spellbinding speaker he is. So that's probably the group that says, well, we think Apollos is, is, is the greatest. Then there's the group that says, well, we're the real Christians. We just follow Jesus. <laughs> and, you know, in every... <laughs> I mean, not to throw any other denomination under the bus, but, um, you know, um, 
There's some great folks in the Church of Christ. But <laughs> I'm going to throw them under the bus. Uh, <laughs> because in, in, when I was in Ada and when I was in Atoka and everything else, I mean, we'd have these ministerial alliances, you know, where all the pastors in town would come together and have like a, a, a fund for homeless people or transients and put on a Thanksgiving things and all that. So you'd have the Baptist minister, the Methodist minister, the Catholic priest, the Presbyterian minister, et cetera, et cetera. Well, the, the, the Church of Christ pastors would never come because they believed they were the only real church. They were the only true church, you know. And, you know, if you tried to, you know, if, if you've seen me draw lines of, of where denominations come from, like, you know, you got, you got this one church and then you split with Catholic and Orthodox, East and West. And then the Protestants, you know, you go the Reformation with Lutherans and Calvinists. And then you got the Church of England and da, da, you got all these branches. And, you know, if you study church history, like, okay, here's where the Church of Christ came from. And they broke off from this branch, 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 branch. But if you talk to a Church of Christ pastor, they'll say, no, it's just the apostles to us. It's a straight line. You know, we're not a part of any of that. We're just the, the, the 12 apostles to the Church of Christ. And all you other folks are, <laughs> you know, <laughs> are not, not part of it. Um, I've known some really nice Church of Christ people. But, <laughs> but they believe they are the only true Christians. At least that's what some Church of Christ congregations teach. And so you get this group. Well, we, we think Paul has it all right. Well, we think Apollos is the one. We think Peter, Cephas is the one. Well, we just follow Jesus. I mean, <laughs> so these are these four groups that are all in the Corinthian church. And Paul is saying, you know, Chloe, and we don't know really too much about who Chloe is, but he says, Chloe has written me and told me you've got all this division. And actually, the word is schismata. We get the word schism from that. Schismata is a word in Greek that means a garment that has been ripped apart, a garment that's been torn. Schismata. So he says, I, I appeal to you that there might not be any schismata among you. Any schismata, any schism, any divisions among you with it. I follow Apollo, Peter, Peter, Paul, Christ. He says in verse 13, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized into the name of Paul? I'm thankful I didn't baptize any of you except for Crispus and Gaius. So no one can say you were baptized into my name. Well, yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Well, beyond that, I don't remember if I baptized anyone else. <laughs> For Christ didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with words of human wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Now, again, I, I often quote this as an example. of Again, some of our Christian sisters and brothers would say, every word of the Bible is dictated by God. God dictated the Bible and the Authors of the Bible, they were just, you know, God was whispering in their ear and they just wrote down whatever God told them to write down. Well, I really have a hard time imagining God saying, now write down, I do not remember who I baptized. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that, that's why one of the reasons I say we don't, we don't read the Bible as it is the dictation of God. Dicta we believe it is the inspired by God's spirit. It's inspired by God. But inspiration doesn't mean dictation, which is different from our Muslim friends. As I've said, our Muslim friends believe the Quran is dictated by God. They believe the Quran is literally the dictation of God. So their view of the Quran is very different from our historically the Christian view of, of the Bible. And there are people who, who, who would say, well, every word is just dictated by God. And you point out passages like this. Why did God say, Paul, write down, I don't remember who I baptized. And like, well, you know, they, they don't really have an answer for that. Um, well, inspiration is not the same as dictation. Um, Paul's humanity 
comes out very clearly in that verse. Because he's saying, um, you know, I'm just glad I didn't baptize hardly anybody because I don't want people to go around saying, well, I'm, you know, I'm, I was baptized by Paul, and that makes me a part of the, the party of Paul, the, the school of Paul, the, the, you know, the cult of Paul. He's like, were you baptized into the name of Paul? No, you were baptized in the name of Jesus. And he's like, for that reason, I'm, I'm just glad I didn't baptize very many people, except oh, those people and that guy, yeah, I don't know who else. Uh, I can't remember. Um, now, he's not downplaying baptism there. He's not saying baptism isn't important. You know, he, when he says, I'm glad I didn't do it or I didn't come to baptize, he's not, he's not uh, you know, saying baptism is somehow wrong or bad or unimportant. He, he's just saying, you know, if I'd baptize a whole bunch of people, they might think, well, we're, we're part of Paul's group. And he's like, no, you know, we're all followers of Jesus, not Paul or Apollo or Peter or anybody else. Um, and notice, I think a slight, maybe a slight, if, if we're right about Apollos, a slight dig at Apollos when he says, I didn't come with human wisdom, um, uh, but lest the cross of Christ be emptied. Paul is going to say multiple times in this letter, basically, I did not come with fancy words. I didn't come with fancy language. He never, he never directly criticizes Apollos, but he kind of differentiates himself by saying, basically, I'm not that eloquent. I'm not a trained orator. You know, I just came to tell the story of Jesus, and I'm not, I'm not saying I'm a great speaker. I'm just telling you, the, telling you the truth. So let's keep going. I want to at least finish the first chapter tonight. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. For it is written... I'll destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent, I will frustrate. Where's the wise man? Where's the scholar? Where's the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom didn't know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Now again, Paul is a learned man. He's a rabbi. He studied on a Gamaliel. He's not saying learning is bad. He's not saying education is bad. He's just saying the wisdom of this world, the people who present themselves as being wise, um, they reject the gospel, um, but they're not as wise as they think they are. And think about it. Where, was he, where, where did I say he was right before he came to Corinth? Where was he? He was in Athens. Do you remember... What one of the things he did when he was in Athens? He met with the philosophers of Athens. He went to the Areopagus, in other words, Mars Hill. And Mars Hill, and Areop Mars is the god of war, but his his uh, Greek name is Ares. Ares and Mars. Ares is the Greek name. Mars is the Roman name. It's the god of war in mythology. The Areopagus. Mars Hill is where the philosophers in Athens would gather to debate and discuss. And just go back there just for a minute to chapter 17 of, uh, uh, and you see um, like who he was talking to. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah. Verse, chapter 17, verse 18. 17, verse 18. Paul is there in the Areopagus. It says, a group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to dispute with him. So Paul gets into a conversation with two schools of philosophy, the Epicureans and the Stoics. Um, and 